Road. Good morning to all you attending our monthly webinar. This is Mark Richardson speaking from uh, Vibrant Technology in Scotts Valley, California, Northern California. And Brian Schwartz is our meeting coordinator and organizer. Uh, we're going to look at the use of macro programs and hotkeys in MEScope this morning. So this is some new capability which used to be an extra cost option and, and uh, recently we've made it a standard feature of MEScope because we've just found uh, so many uses for macro programming uh, in MEScope. And we're going to look at two different applications today. You can see an animating ODS on the screen in front of you. This is a rotor kit that we have here at, at Vibrant and I'm going to uh, show you how we use macro programming and hotkeys to uh, review this data and then we'll kind of go backwards and look at the, the actual uh, machine itself and how we took the data and then how we built this animated picture in MEScope. A lot of different tools were used here in fact. We used the experimental FEA to build a FEA model of the base plate and bearing blocks. Uh, we got experimental data from the eight accelerometers that you can see as the machine was operating at a specific speed and then uh, we expanded that experimental data into some uh, ODS's that are animating the entire model here. And then we're also using interpolation to uh, interpolate parts of the machine, uh, specifically in this case the rotating parts and the power supply and the motor here uh, where we didn't have any data. So that they're all being animated using uh, our geometric interpolation uh, that's available in MEScope also. So a lot of things going on here, but let's just Let's just take a quick look at this, these results and then uh, we'll, as I say, we'll, we'll work backwards and look at uh, the macro programs behind this and the hotkeys. The second example we're going to look at is uh, something called the QTS, uh, Qualification Testing System. This is where we add a larger database and another uh, software package called the console to MEScope. And um, we'll get into all the details of that uh, after we look at this, this uh, model here and, and the use here of, of uh, macro programs. So let me go and uh, just show you what's in this project. There's quite a bit of stuff here. Uh, there are two different models. So let me stop the animation here and uh, show you those two models. And they're set up differently. Uh, I'm going to arrange my windows and here's the other model. This is the way you would use uh, MEScope without the shape expansion capability where you're simply uh, using geometric interpolation for all the points uh, that are unmeasured on the model. So here we have um, the same data that we took uh, from the experimental set up, but we're simply using geometric interpolation to animate the model. So without the shape expansion in the FEA model, this is what the animation would look like. Now we're going to use macro programming to compare the two results, the, the uh, expanded shapes with the just the experimental data itself. So let me go stop this and I'm going to rearrange things here again. And let's go back and look at these macro programs. So there are actually five different programs that have been written. The first one's called Arrange Windows. That's the program that I just executed. And I did that by going up here to a hotkey that I've defined that says Arrange Windows. So when I press that key, it runs that macro program and it does the instructions in that program. So Pretty obviously what that program is doing is simply arranging windows inside of MEScope uh, in the work area. 
this program here is called Expand the ODS. So that's how we're going to take FEA mode shapes, curve fit them to the experimental ODS data from the eight accelerometers, and then uh, animate that data. And we've got data for three different RPM values, uh, the first shape, the second shape, the third shape, where is that data? Let's let's just go look at that data here for a minute. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start the animation and and uh, let's uh, go back and look at look at our experimental ODS data here. So the, here's my animation source up here. It's a shape table with three speeds in it. So I'm gonna click here, and now here is the experimental data taken from this machine. You can see there's three different shapes at three different RPM values, and uh, at 985, 1440, and 2280. So as I click on these, you can see that the operating deflection shape of this machine changes quite dramatically uh, at different running speeds. So are there resonances involved? Of course there are. Uh, we assume in modal analysis that any of the operating deflection shape data that we can acquire from a, a machine is a summation of contributions due to all of its resonances. And there could also be force response in there simply in this case, sinusoidal motion of a little bit of unbalance or misalignment that's causing the machine to uh, follow the, the forcing function. So there's a little bit of that, but you can see that there's some flexure here too. So there are modes involved in this machine uh, that are being excited as well as uh, simply uh, some forced motion. Now we had 22 degrees of freedom, in, or 24, I'm sorry, 24 measurements. Remember in our shape table and also with our traces, uh, these are uh, numbered 1 through 24, and here's our degrees of freedom. And uh, this is ODS data, and it's in units of inches per second. So we've actually integrated our accelerometer data into velocity data. So that's the results of the experiment. Let's go back for a minute and just take a look at the test setup. And I'm going to go in here and click on a, one of these. I've got some added files. So here are some JPEGs and also, um, well, let me just start with this one and open it up. And there is a picture that I took of uh, with my iPhone of the experimental setup. You can see the accelerometers, uh, just like they are on the model. Those are triaxial accelerometers. So we had eight triaxial accelerometers, uh, three degrees of freedom each uh, for a total of 24 degrees of freedom. You can see there's one on each bearing block. Uh, there's three down that side of the plate, and then there's three on the back side of the plate also. Here is a laser tachometer. Uh, this one uh, works just like an accelerometer. You, you plug it into one of the BNC ports in the analyzer, and it's powered by the analyzer. And so uh, it, on that channel, we acquire the RPM of the machine. There's a piece of reflective tape on this rotor so that as the uh, machine rotates or the rotor rotates, the, uh, the uh, tachometer picks up the reflection of the, from the tape. So there's a different view, the backside with the motor. The other nice thing about this uh, rotor kit, it's uh, made by a company uh, called VTech in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's light, it's easy to transport and so forth. and uh, we can uh, do various uh, experiments with it. So uh, you can see right here, there's a variable speed knob. So I can change the speed of rotation, and that's how we were able to get those three different ODSs 
uh, at the different speeds of the machine. Now here's a picture of the, we call this a Mechanicon box, but we're going to go into that later and show you the different options. Uh, this is MEScope running in a, in a solid state computer inside of this Pelican suitcase box and there's an analyzer in there. In this case, there's a 24 channel analyzer also in the box with MEScope and the computer. So this is a portable data acquisition system with uh, each of these modules here has eight channels in it. Uh, you can see there's, there's four on the top and then there's four on the bottom. And I simply plug everything into this box with BNC connectors and I'm ready to go to uh, take operating data on a machine like this. So this is how we did the experiment here at, at Vibrant and uh, how it would be done in the field. So we'll look at some more of this in, in detail when we get to the, uh, to the second example. But let me go here. You can see up on this toolbar, I've got three hotkeys. Now these have flames on them to kind of remind you that they are hotkeys. And if I press one of these, that key will execute a macro program. Well, where do I set that up? Let me come over here under macro. And right here is a, is a, a menu that says hotkeys. And I'm going to go under hotkey setup. This is where I define the hotkeys. Let me get this and I'll uh, expand this out a little bit so we can see how we define a hotkey. So these are just lines in a spreadsheet like many of the properties in MEScope. We use spreadsheets and then each column has a different property in it. Here I've defined four hotkeys and you can see a plus sign up here. I can, I can add more hotkeys by pressing that, uh, that plus sign. See, I could just add them. And now I've got two new hotkeys. Uh, let me delete them back out again because I don't want them to be in this definition. I've given them a name, first shape, second shape, third shape. So we looked at the three ODSs at the three different RPMs. And, uh, and then I have a fourth hotkey here called arrange windows. Each of these hotkeys, when I press it, will execute a macro program. The first one's called first shape, second shape, third shape. We'll look at this in a minute. All machines, we have a database with our uh, advanced monitoring software uh, where we can store data for multiple machines. And we'll look at that in the, in the second example. And then over here, I can pick a an icon, and you can see the first three are, are flames, but I have a pick list of all sorts of icons here that I can assign to the various hotkeys. All right, well, that's how they get defined. Let's go look at these macro programs, uh, first shape, second shape, third shape, arrange windows. We already talked about that one. Those are over under my macros uh, definition here in my project pane and let's just click on this one and open up the one called first shape. Now a macro program has two, here's the window that's showing you the macro program and it's showing uh, two spreadsheets. The top one is the command, has command lines in it and you can see that uh, really the two important things are the target window name, where this command is going to be executed, and the target window command. So any command in MEScope can be added to a macro program. And then we have a description over here, and we have an open dialog box if we want to open it and interact with it. Many of the commands have dialogs associated with them. But if I say no, to the open dialog, then I have to come down here and add in the parameters that are associated with that command. So this particular command, I'm sitting on this line right here, it says in this window itself, in this window called first shape, execute a, a command called macro variable 
macro variable one equal to local variable two. But what does all that mean? Well, if I come over here into the description, I get a little better idea of what that means. It sets variable one in another macro equal to local variable two. So local variable two means there's a variable in this program that I'm going to assign to a variable in another macro. All right, well, if I come down here, that starts to make a little more sense. Macro name, expand the ODS. So that's another macro program that we haven't looked at yet, but that's the one that's going to actually take my 24 degrees of freedom and expand them using mode shapes, uh, doing a curve fit of a modal model to my ODS data to obtain an expanded ODS and then it's going to animate it for me. So what it's doing is going to set, here's a hotkey case, it's going to set a variable called hotkey case equal to one. So that's all it's going to do in this program when I execute this command. Well, let's go over to expand the ODS and see what that looks like. So that program here is going to be, um, oh, and then the second command in my, in my macro, let's go back here, is simply going to execute that macro. So it's going to say, go over to the window called expand the ODS and run the macro one time. So executes all enabled macro steps once in that program. And there's no parameters associated with this. So when I hit the hotkey number one, it's going to set a variable in this other program called hotkey um, case, hotkey case, and then it's going to execute the program. So let's go over and look at that program and see what, what it's doing. Let's go back and get expand the ODS. So here's expand the ODS, and the first thing it's going to do is define that variable called HK case or hot key case. It's expanding that. Let me expand this a little bit so we can read it better. Then it's going to go to my shape table that we were animating out of called three speeds and it's going to select the shape using the hot the HK case variable. So the shape number is going to select as number one if I press the hot key for shape number one. Uh, select shape, select none. Now it's operating in another shape table called first 10 SDM modes. We'll take a look at that in a minute and those are the FEA mode shapes that we obtained for the base plate and the bearing blocks of the rotor machine, of the VTEC rotor. I'll take you back and we'll look at how that how that was done. We actually used SDM to create that modal model with shapes in it. And then we, this next step here is that we're going to do a shape expansion. That's a standard command and we're going to do it in the three speed shape table. We're going to expand the 24 degrees of freedom to many more degrees of freedom, however many there are in our mode shapes to create an expanded shape. So down here it says replace the source shape table is the first 10 SDM modes and we're executing this in the three speeds and we're going to replace the modes in the destination table and that shape table is called expanded ODS. So the next step then we're going to uh, select the first, again this is just a repeat of this command here, not really necessary but it's in there, it's going to again select the, the HK case, uh, if it's the first shape that's equal to a 1, then it's going to position all the, uh, it says window position, uh, Let's see what that's doing here. Okay, it's it's positioning a window. Uh, this is executing out of my Emiscope 
window. So it's executing a command called macro window position. And here's some percentages. And the file name that it's going to position is a structure window called expanded shape model. So it's going to position that window. And then it's going to execute in the expanded shape model window, the STR expanded shape model, uh, a comparison shape. And what it's going to compare is the expanded ODS with the three speeds ODS. And the comparison structure is the VTEC uh, MBAT3. So that's the structure window that we already animated shapes in here. Let me put this down. And, uh, we'll put this one down and this is the this is the VTEC MBAT3 that we were animating shapes from before. So if I start the animation here. Um, so that is our experimental data with geometric interpolation. Okay, so we went through what these hotkeys are going to do. Let's just press one and see what happens. I'm going to press the first shape hotkey. And bingo, there it is. A comparison display on the right is the geometric interpolation. On the left is the expanded shape using the experimental data from the, the uh, three speeds over here. You can see our, our two animation sources are also set up. Here's the expanded shape at 985 RPM. Down here we've got 985 selected in the three speeds. Now remember, three speeds only has 24 degrees of freedom in it. Let's look at the expanded ODS here, and I'm going to draw down here to see how many degrees of freedom. Almost 2,000 degrees of freedom, 1,938. Well, I clicked on the wrong button here. Um, I wanted to expand that just so that we could see the 938 a little better. Now, what we're also displaying up here are the MAC value between the two shapes, the unexpanded and the expanded. Now, of course, they're only being compared at the common degrees of freedom. So the model on the left has been numbered so that the accelerometer locations are numbered the same as they are on the model on the right. And so the MAC value is saying that these two shapes, the expanded one and the unexpanded one, are 87% alike. And here's a second measure. And this is something new in MEScope, relatively new. We've written a few technical papers on it. It's called the shape difference indicator. We're going to use this in a number of ways. We'll see in the next uh, experiment or the next uh, project that we use that to detect differences in frequencies. But this is a, whereas the MAC value tells us whether two vectors lie along the same straight line, in other words, they're collinear, the SDI value tells us whether, in fact, the two shapes have exactly the same numbers in them the same values. It's a difference between the two shapes. And there's a little mathematics behind it, but just suffice it to say that they're measuring similar but different properties of these two shapes. Let's go click on the second button, which is the, the second shape. And now we've got the 1440 RPM expanded shape. And down here, we're animating the, out of the three speeds, the 1440 RPM. The shape has changed dramatically. You can say that the expanded matches up even more closely with the experimental data on the right. Finally, I'm going to hit the third button here. 
and you can see that even more so at the 24 degrees of freedom where these two shapes are common to one another, uh, we have a very good curve fit of the modal model to the experimental ODS data. So let's go back and look at the modal model and I already mentioned that what's going on here is that we have built an FEA model of this. Uh, I'm going to go back and just animate the uh, expanded shapes here for a minute and then let's go over and look at what the mode shapes look like. Here's the first 10 SDM modes. Now let me just explain to you very quickly um, how we got these modes. Here's the mode shape table. It's got the 1900 degrees of freedom in it that we looked at from the expanded ODS. Let's just draw these down and take a look here. There they are. And here are the mode shapes. Now this is on a sweep animation. Let me start it back here at the beginning. The first six modes out of the FEA model are rigid body modes. The frequencies don't matter, only the mode shapes. So what we did is take these 10 mode shapes and we curve fit them to the experimental ODS data at the 24 degrees of freedom and we got expanded ODS data using this modal model. So again, the, the only important thing are the shapes themselves. You can see the last four modes of this uh, structure are rigid or uh, flexible by flexible modes. So let me let me do something else here so you can see more clearly what I'm talking about. There is the FEA model that we use to uh, create these mode shapes. And the way we did that, it was all done in MEScope. We solved for the modes of the base plate by itself in a free-free condition. And then we solved for the modes of one of the bearing blocks in a free-free condition. Using uh, solid elements uh, and the experimental FEA capability in MEScope where we simply take the geometry right from the experimental model. That's what we mean by experimental FEA. We take the experimental model, add elements to it, solve for the analytical modes. Then with the modes of one bearing block, and then we simply cut and copy that bearing block to the other one, along with its, uh, its modes and its FEA uh, elements. Then we used SDM to attach the bearing blocks to the base plate with very stiff springs. So each bearing block was attached to the base plate with 36 stiff springs. Really just six springs that were stiff in the X, the Y, and the Z direction. I'm not going to go into all that today. Uh, but suffice it to say that these mode shapes uh, came from uh, very simple FEA models uh, for the base plate and bearing block and then using SDM to attach them together. Now the reason SDM was so useful is that you can see here that the points on the bearing blocks do not match up with the points on the base plate. If I, uh, let me just turn off the, some things here, and turn on points. Now you can see that the various points don't match up, but that's not important with SDM. We simply are modeling a very stiff connection of the bearing blocks to the base plate in this case. So that's how we built the modal model. And then if I go back here and, and hit Uh, there we have, let's, let's uh, turn things back on here again. Uh, let's turn on the surfaces and let's turn on the, okay, so what do we have here? Turn off points and, wow, MAC values and SDI are very low, how come? 
that I cannot explain. We're not getting good values here. Oh, there we go. So there are some good values. Let's go back and click on this one. And so here we are back pressing the hotkeys and looking at the three different um, cases of our experimental ODS data being expanded by, oh, I see what's going on. We're, we're switching. See, see how, the reason these are dropping down is that this, this one is now on a sweep. It's sweeping, and there, there they match up to 2280. Uh, but since I turned on the sweep animation, it's still it's still sweeping. So let me turn that off. I'll go down here under uh, method and put it back on sign dwell. So that's what happened. But now you see the power of the hotkeys and the macro programs that allow me to repeat over and over. Okay, so let's. Um, Let's go on to the next example, and uh, I have another project up here, and it's called Jim Beam QTS. So let me double click on that one, and do I want to save this project? No, and I'll open this one up. Now this is an experiment that we did uh, with the Jim Beam using curve fitting and comparing the frequencies of the first six modes of the gem beam uh, with some stored values of the frequencies. And by doing that and using the SDI calculation, the shape difference calculation, we can identify a particular physical characteristic of the gem beam. So let me go over here and show you some of the, the you can see there's a number of macro programs in here, and there's a number of photographs and uh, some GIF files. So let me go through the photographs first and show you what uh, what this is all about. Here's a photograph of the gym beam with a triaxial accelerometer just placed anywhere on it, and an impact hammer, and over here on the left is a torque wrench. So this is a small torque wrench and we're going to use that torque wrench to apply different tightness to one of these cap screws here that holds the gym beam plates together. Let me go through here and you can see there there is our test set up with a torque wrench, the triaxial accelerometer, the impact hammer, a four channel analyzer, so we've got force in the first channel and three acceleration uh, signals from the impulse of the hammer into the other three channels. There's another picture of it. And here's a picture of the cap screws. So we simply use the torque wrench to apply different torque to one of the cap screws. We impacted the structure measured three FRFs and you can impact it anywhere. You can put the reference accelerometer anywhere. In this case we're not interested in shapes, we're only interested in the frequencies of some of the modes of this gym beam. And this experiment shows how sensitive modal frequencies are to uh, a physical change. And what we did here was we Tighten the the uh, one of the cap screws to 10 inch pounds of torque, then 15, then 20, then 25, then 30, then 35. So we had six different torque cases, and actually six different modes, which is just coincidental. Now what we're using here is some of our newer software. This, of course, is EMI-scope, and you can see uh, the experimental data that we took. Let me just show you the data. And this has been recorded so that we can simulate this impact testing uh, with the pre-recorded data. So here we've got, let me put it on the top. There's the impulse right there 
of the hammer, and here are the impulse responses of the accelerometer in the X, Y, and Z uh, for the first uh, case of uh, 10 inch pounds. And then let me just draw this down and I'll show it to you a, a better way here. So there's the fourth case, or the, the sixth case, where again, it's just a, a, different, a different torque on one of the cap screws. Now, how did we process this data? We, we did it in the acquisition window. Again, this is all standard capabilities in Emiscope. Uh, with an acquisition window, and you can see here on the top are four of uh, the signals that we pre-recorded, and this is for the 10-inch pound case. If you look over here, this is a measurement set one of six. So this acquisition window has been set up with six measurement sets. And in this case, we simply turned on the first four channels of acquisition. Here's the data here. Here's the FRF that we computed. Actually, there's three of them, three FRFs from this data. So no averaging here, simply a, a calculation of an FRF. Uh, here's some of the sampling and, and so forth. Pretty much standard stuff. Um, and one average. So nice clean data, hit it with a hammer one time, acquire the data with the analyzer, and compute an FRF. And then we're going to go ahead and save those FRFs, curve fit them, and we're going to do all this under program control. Let me show you what will happen when I go to the, to the next case here. It's going to change to the next measurement set. So you can see here's the 15 inch pound measurement set. I'm going to use measurements five through eight uh, out of the data block in this case. And those match up uh, with these channel numbers. And then if I move down to the next set here, this is measurement set number three. You can see it says MS3 of six. And there's measurement set number four and so on, on down to the bottom. We're going to control all this with a macro program. So let me put this back. And uh, the macro program, the next step it's going to go through is doing a curve fit. And we'll see how that works in a minute. But here is the result of the curve fit. You can see we curve fit six modes. And the curve fit function is laying on top of our experimental data. Now, again, the motive here, the only thing that we're after are the frequencies of these first six modes. Then we're going to take this data into our, what used to be called Mechanicom. Now we've changed it to a set of options for Emiscope uh, that adds a larger database where I can archive this type of data, and then I can compare the the results that I get from a modal test, in this case, with uh, data that's already stored in the database and identify the actual torque that was applied. Over here is the curve fit parameters, and you can see that um, all we're saving here are frequencies of the six modes, and there's some damping values also, but we're going to focus our attention on the frequencies and we're not even going to save the residues because we don't care about the uh, mode shape components in this case. We only care about frequency, and we also looked at damping, but we're going we're gonna to look at just frequencies. So what are the macro programs in here? Well, you can see there's six of them, uh, or the hotkeys up here. I've got six hotkeys, one through six, and each one of them is labeled with a different torque value, so I can simulate impacting the structure, acquiring its data from this data block over here into the acquisition window, storing those results over here. Now, this is an arrange windows hotkey. We saw that before. If I press that, it simply 
runs that macro and arranges the four windows. Here's a curve fit command or hotkey. That one's going to run a different macro program which automatically curve fits the data. And then finally a, a command that archives the shape values over here, the frequencies and damping into uh, the Mechanicom database. And this whole process here is called uh, QTS. It's a QTS demo qualification testing system. Let's go look at some, some other things over here. Uh, we looked at the test setup. Uh, here is uh, a block diagram of what we're talking about here. Let me see if I can make this a little larger. We saw the Mechanicom boxes, the acquisition, multi-channel acquisition. Of course, this is showing it monitoring some machinery like in our previous example. But in this case, we're going to do impact testing and qualify a mechanical structure based on the torque values that, let's say this is an assembly line and we're assembling gym beams and we want to get the correct torque value. So this would be a go, no go type system. Here's the Mechanicom database, and then we can look at the data uh, with the console program in a number of different ways. Uh, let's go to the next one here. Okay, this is showing what the type of data we're going to get in console. We've got a 3D model of the machine, trend plots of its data, uh, data blocks of time or frequency traces, just like MESCOPE. Uh, the trend plots come from shape tables, so these are really just an extension of the MESCOPE data files into a larger database. And then we have something called a, an event log, and I'm going to show you how we can create events, and in this case, the event is identification of a set of modal frequencies corresponding to a torque value. Here's another layout of uh, the software, again, this is all just software that we're talking about here. The hardware box is, is pretty simple. We simply buy uh, equipment and assemble it into the box. We don't make hardware. All of this software can work in your own computers with your own acquisition. Uh, and then here's the database. And then different people can look at the data over a network. This is all network-based. For instance, this Mechanicom database can be put in the cloud and we have customers now that are using um, phone modems to uh, collect the data at a remote site, put it into the cloud database and then anybody on the internet can access data with a console program. Now it's all security protected and so forth so strangers can't get into your database. Um, so that's a layout of our newer system and let me just show you one more thing here and that is how we have rebranded it as simply more options to ME scope. Let me see if I can get this open here. Okay, so here, here it is right here. This is our price list, and what we're looking at, or what we're going to look at here in a minute, is what we call MESCOPE QTS, Qualification Testing Series. Now, these packages are just like our MESCOPE VES packages. They're uh, some new MEC option software plus MESCOPE, in this case, a VT620. Uh, let me see if I can make this a little larger. And here's a machine and structure qualification testing, and then machine structure and acoustic. These are packages. Remember that our packages are simply uh, a, a, a visual ODS system, the base MESCOPE system, plus different options. Here's our environmental surveillance series. We're already deploying these for simply measuring vibration and acoustic at environmental sites. So you can build different packages uh, by uh, 
different using different options. Here's our ro rotating machine surveillance series. Again, it's a visual ODS plus some acquisition option plus uh, a console software and database option. So these options are, are very similar here, the monitoring and testing options. Uh, they simply use different terminology. So we're going to uh, use the uh, qualification testing capability. And we're also going to use something called fault correlation or facts. So I'll show that to you in a minute where we actually use the SDI calculation on the frequencies to identify a torque value. So this is our standard price list and up here is, is all the Emmyscope VES uh, packages and options. Uh, those are pretty much the same. So we've got really three new package series and including, in addition to the visual engineering series, we now have the, the MSS, the ESS, and the QTS. Uh, here's MSS. And these are just ME scope with some new options assigned. All right, let's go back to ME scope here and look at um, some of these macro programs. So let's again remember how we define the hot keys. Let me come up here under macro and we'll look at the hot key definition. So here I've set up my hot keys. I've defined, I've given them a name. There's a range windows. I've got one called curve fit and one called archive now. And these are only going to work on the Jim Beam QTS uh, test article that's in the in the Mechanicom database, in the large database that, as I said, is a network-based database, can be located anywhere on a network. And let me just go and show you how one of these hot keys works. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on uh, the macros themselves. We already saw. Okay, so if I press a different hotkey here, that's simply acquiring the data from this data block into the uh, acquisition window. So watch, watch down here. You can see the FRFs change as I press different hotkeys. So all that's doing is simulating the acquisition of impact data from the gem beam. Each one of those is, is slightly different. Now you can see that we got a band cursor set up here and we're actually saving just the data for the first six for the first six modes. So the macro program is doing all that. Now if I press a curve fit button, it's going to take this data here that's in this in this uh, data block with the three FRS. Remember, we had a triaxial uh, accelerometer and uh, the impact hammer. So if I do that, bingo, there it is. Um, and you can see that what it did, I'll do that again, it's using our polynomial quick fit to fit the six modes and it saves the data over here in the in the shape table. So that's pretty fast. Let me try, let's just go get a different one. I'll acquire that one and we'll push that. You can see how it, got, it went into curve fitting. It curve fit the FRF and it put the frequencies here into the, into the uh, curve fit parameters table. Now if I hit the archive, that's going to put that data into the Mechanicom or the machine, or in this case, the QTS database. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's a, another menu up here, and this is where I connect up to that database. Again, it can be over a network. Uh, I'm going to, it says, add or select a DCF file. Now, this is a database connection file that uh, gives me a secure connection to that database. And this is how we can control only MEScope and only console users that are authorized to get in or connect to the data in that database. So I'm going to go ahead and connect up. And now it says connected to the Mechanicom database. And I'll close that. 
uh, and now what it's done is opening up the machine definition or in this case the test article uh, and it's saying that the test article is a gem beam and I have a 3D model of it, a structure model. I've got what's called a monitored shape table. Now that's where the curve fit parameters are going to go. And then I can also animate shapes in the console, but in this case I have none. And I've also got my frequency traces. I can have time traces. I can have octave traces if I've got uh, acoustic data. So this defines in the database uh, this particular test article, and it's already in there. So let's go look at what's in the database with the console because I can actually press these hotkeys from the console and remotely control MEScope from the console software. So I'm going to put this down, bring up the console software. Well, it says it wants to install. Cancel. No. Here it is up here. Wrong button, I guess. Okay, so here's console coming up. And it's connecting to the database. Okay, so this is, let's go back here to something called the machine gallery. Now I'm set up with a, with a uh, machine, an MSS console here, machine surveillance console, because I've got three different examples here. Here is an example of an ESS monitoring application where we simply have a map of a, let me open this up, and show you, here's a, here's a map of a test site, happens to be in Toronto, Canada, with four accelerometers. So that's how we do environmental monitoring, and we can set up warning levels and so forth for that uh, test site. That's our environmental testing. Here's a rotating, here's an MSS. This is the, uh, the rotating machine and you can see some various RPMs. Let's look at the model here. So here's, here's our model that we looked at earlier, animating with uh, the expanded shape data um, that we looked at in the previous example. So that's a, an example of an MSS system. And then finally, we're going to come over here to the gem beam, which is, uh, here's our gem beam model. And again, we're going to look at different cases where we tighten one of these cap screws and impacted it with a hammer. And uh, this is an example of qualification testing or uh, QTS. So we got all three examples here in this database on my, on my computer. So let me go back to the, I'm going to close this one. We'll, we'll just close it here for a minute so we're not looking at the wrong thing. I'm going to close this tab. Okay, so we'll go back to Jim Beam. Now what do we have here? We've got a, a trend plot, actually a couple of them. Here are the six cases of frequencies and this is a this is a trend plot. Now I've got it in a bar chart uh, format so you can see the six frequencies of these uh, of these different cases. Up here are the hot keys and see you can these are re the same hot keys that we had in MEScope so they're connected through the database to MEScope and if I press one of these hot keys I will cause MEScope to acquire the data for this particular case and and then I'll curve it the data and then I'll archive it and it will show up here in the console. What I want to show you though is the use of what we call facts. And this has been set up so that each time an event occurs, 
Now, an event is what I've already defined in here. See, I've defined these events as operator events. And there's one for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 foot pounds. So these events and the snapshot data for each of those events has been saved in a database. And FACS will now apply the SDI calculation or the shape difference calculation to, to the current data coming in and compare it with the events that I've defined in the event log. So the events are defined over here. Uh, we, can, we can edit. Let me just show you uh, display bar, edit. Here's where I've defined um, a fax calculation, if you will. I've said take all the frequencies, all six frequencies uh, that are being logged into the database and compare those with frequencies that are already stored in the database and correlate those using the SDI calculation. So let me just show you here, uh, there's some more setup here, but I'm going to click on one of these buttons. Let's click on the 10 inch pounds. Now you can see the program it must be running because it's not allowing me to do anything here. Okay, it's finished. Now let me curve fit the data. This is going on in the background with ME Scope, but this is to be remotely over a network. It could be anywhere. And now I'm going to archive that data into the database. See, it showed up here. Fax identified it as the 10 inch pounds case. This picture was updated, and now the 10 inch pounds was identified because I had defined that as an event with its corresponding frequency values. Let's try one more. Let's try uh, 25 inch pounds. So we're going to grab that case, acquire that data. Uh, let's curve fit it. And then let's archive it. And there it is, 25 inch pounds was the maximum correlation. You can see these other events that I've stored in my database uh, don't correlate as well with the case of the 25 inch pounds. Okay, well, we've spent an hour together. I've showed you some, some new features, and uh, we looked at QTS here as an example of our using our Mechanicom database and uh, hotkeys and macro programming to remotely uh, execute commands in MEScope, and uh, we can use them for repeatable or remote control. Anyway, that's... Uh, the end of our discussion, uh, and we're going to wrap this up. So thank you for coming, well, and we'll see you next month with some more. We do have discussion. one question. All right, Brian is interrupting. Here we have a question from uh, one of you, and uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning that any of you uh, that attend these uh, webinars can uh, send emails with questions, and uh, so we'll answer that one right now. Okay, uh, the question is, are macros and hotkeys shared across projects? Macros are part of a project, and hotkeys are, are defined in a project. However, I can define, uh, using a macro, I can have one project open another project. And so I can link together or chain together as many projects as I, as I want to, and that's a good thing in MEScope because its its own database is, is limited as opposed to the database that we're using here for the QTS. That's a much larger database. So when we have too many uh, data blocks or too many shape tables, too many structures, whatever we have in an in a MEScope project, we can simply break it up into several and then use hotkeys to go from one to the next. Hopefully that answers uh, your question. No, the, and the shared properties are only in the use of our console software here. Console is sharing these hotkeys uh, through the database 
for this particular machine. Uh, if you saw back in MEScope where we defined the hotkeys, uh, right here, machine name, if I, if I put in, uh, I can put in all machines and then those hotkeys will be shared uh, by all machines in the database. But the Mechanicom database is a machine-based, or in this case, a test article. So these hotkeys are only going to show up when I go to the Jim Beam QTS test article. And of course, when it says none, that means that the Arrange Windows hotkey will only work, if I press Arrange Windows, that only works in the project that it's defined in. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there and uh, see you next month if uh, we have something of interest to share with you.